Welcome to the Startup Grind. Um, that is an awesome welcome. So I understand pretty much everybody here is starting a company or is part of a startup as an entrepreneur. So it's great to be in a room of people who are as crazy as, uh, as all of us. Um, there's a couple things I want to talk about. I'm just going to walk through a little of our company, our founding story. I think so much of the value of getting together with entrepreneurs is sharing stories to help give us all courage when we're out there doing crazy things. And then um, as it comes to scaling and bootstrapping, there's three, three issues I'll, I'll hit on real quick. Culture, product, and, and advocacy. So the question I always get asked is, how did two guys um, start a soap company? Still not sure, but this is the story I've pieced together. Um, I never thought I was smart enough to actually create a new business plan, and I always liked how Richard Branson would go in and try to disrupt really tired categories. So my whole thesis for starting a business was just to find a really big and boring category that missed a cultural shift. And I worked in advertising, so I understood consumer motivations. And I just started looking at this aisle because it was so big and yet so boring. And it's very ironic because I lived with five guys at the corner of Pine and Golf in San Francisco. It was a very dirty flat. Um, this is not the Martha Stewart story by any means. Uh, we were better known for the parties we threw than the actual cleanliness of our place. And we started digging into it, and I realized there was this big, big cultural shift the category was missing, which was lifestyling or the home. And nobody was thinking about these products as an extension of their home, about the design, something that would be beautiful enough you could leave it on the counter versus hidden underneath, underneath the sink, out of sight, out of mind. And then we started digging a little further and realized, like, wow, like, cleaning is actually a really dirty industry. So you pollute when you clean, use poison to make your home healthier, and if we were ever lucky enough to have a successful business, we'd actually leave a legacy of harm in the form of uh, child poisonings that occur every day from these common household products. So Adam and I, we started the company. We came from very different backgrounds. Uh, I came from more of a design. Uh, he came from uh, sustainability. And we're taking credit for it because nobody's told us they've done it first, but we took high design and deep sustainability and tried to put it into a single product offering. And back in 2001, uh, we had a real problem, which was when we told, uh, basically, we we're trying to raise capital. We we're like, yeah, we're going to go up against Procter and Unilever and Clorox and like these companies with a 150-year head start. And we we're going to do it in a category worth eh, maybe 30 million if you round up, which was green cleaning. And if you talk to anybody about green cleaner, nobody believed they work. That green doesn't clean, and why should I sacrifice when I know my neighbor's flushing Ajax down the toilet? So we had to figure out, how do you get the mainstream into a green product? This was our first ad, and we felt like putting naked people was a good start. Um, and we all know people pay a premium for what's scarce, and there is nothing more scarce than fun when it comes to cleaning. Uh, but we also wanted to prove a point, which was, unlike our competitors' products when you use them, chances are you put on that team-building exercise sweatshirt from 1996, the rubber gloves, because you don't want anything touching your skin. Um, with method, if you did choose to clean in the nude, I guarantee uh, there should be no harm, no foul. And that is a very well strategically placed cactus. Um, we have matured a little since uh, starting, the, starting the company. Um, and really, you know, every ba business has a, a pitch. Our elevator pitch was a beta for the home. And I love the idea of blurring the lines between personal care and home care. So with that mission, we went out into the world for a very awkward start on February 28, 2001 at the local Molly Stones, not far from here. Um, and we had to get that proof of concept. And so what we did is we went out and found like those 30 Bay Area stores. We could go find the store manager at 6 a.m. You could bug the guy until the point he would agree to carry your products, and then we would deliver it ourselves. Um, we didn't have marketing dollars, so I would promise in-store demos, which was basically uh, me in a lab coat. Um, I'm not sure why I'm standing in the liquor aisle. <laughs> I think I just figured out people shopping for wine were way more interesting to talk to than people shopping for um, cleaning products. Um, but we went out there and we built out of 30 stores. We put our own money. From there, we got a little bit of traction. Uh, we were able to raise an angel round. We expand to all of the Bay uh, uh, West Coast grocery store chains. And from there, we went and raised our Series A. So what we did is we just broke it into little bite-sized steps. With each funding level, we proved the business, raised a little bit more capital, and just took it step by step. 
But one of the big steps we took is we raised our Series A. Um, we, were, we were losing money pretty fast at this point. Essentially, every bottle we sold, we lost money on because these are categories of scale. And all of our competitors own their own plants, and they've you know, really worked their gross margin down um, to the point where a new startup coming in, it's really hard to make money. So we needed scale. So I shot off my mouth and said, you know, we're going to get Target. Um, they're going to love us. They're about design. We're about design. And so the first meeting went OK. Um, they literally, they didn't like the name. I'm like, you're Target. How do you not like Method? Um, they didn't like the s <laughs> they didn't like the size. They didn't like anything about it. And finally, um, the DMM, who's a pretty senior individual, goes, "Guys, he's like, I hate to say it, but it's a snowball's chance in hell." So we're like, "Dumb and dumber." You're like, "So you're saying we got a chance?" <laughs> <laughs> and as you know, um, for those of you starting a business and you get into these scary moments where things didn't go to plan it's always scarier to go backwards than it is to go forward. So we had to figure a way into it. And we started working with Karen Rashid, who's a very famous industrial designer. Um, as the trick with bootstrapping and creating any company, it's getting people to work for free or almost free. Uh, so we, vinced, we convinced Karen to design the first product with us. Uh, we knew Target wanted to work with Karen. So we used Karen as the carrot to get a meeting with Target Marketing, who then invited um, some very angry buyers um, to sit down with us and do a big dog and pony show. And uh, moments before this meeting, our first prototype showed up from Karim. I had just enough time to literally fill it with soap. And uh, as it was being passed around the room, quickly dawned on me I was pitching a sex toy as a dish soap. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, Target thought it was a good idea. Um, and literally, this thing, uh, I didn't even have a chance to test it. The person who said snowball's chance in hell, it got to him. He squeezed it. He goes, oh my god, even I would use this. And it was like that back to the future moment where Marty's like slowly fading, and all of a sudden he photo and he springs back to life. Like suddenly we had a business. And uh, we went on to, we were given a 60 store test, uh, which we failed miserably. Um, essentially, uh, they gave us a, uh, a metric that we would have no chance of hitting. And you know, we're going to every store, setting up end caps, passing out coupons. Finally, we're buying the product ourselves. <laughs> In San Francisco, we're like boxing it. We're shipping it back to them, buying it again. <laughs> Just doing anything we can to hit this number. And I think the buyers were still angry. So they, told, they basically gave us the number of what Tide would do on sale on an end cap, not a new brand overpriced. And with any success story, we had lots of lucky breaks. And one of our big lucky breaks is a new senior buyer came onto the desk and uh, loved the differentiation, the incrementality, and gave us national authorization. And this year, we'll do about $80 million at, at Target as one of our, our strongest retailers. <laughs> and I heard a phrase once that I always love, which is like, when you're starting a business, it's not about winning every day. It's just about not dying. And like, holding on long enough until those, you finally create those lucky breaks that propel the business forward. So kind of in the spirit of sharing, three things I want to talk to as it refers to bootstrapping. One is this idea of culture. So at Method, everything starts with culture. And when you're starting a business and just fighting for survival and trying to figure out if you're going to make payroll, like the idea of culture is kind of a faraway fantasy. But arguably, it's the most important thing you do as far as building a really strong foundation underneath the business that allows you to scale. Five minutes already? Wow. Um, this is uh, our lobby in San Francisco. So we start every Monday with an all-company huddle, 100 people. Somebody different leads it. And it's all about the idea. And every company should do this from day one. It's about the idea that we're all in this together in a way to start flexing those collaboration muscles. Um, you all know the most important thing is hiring. And if there's one idea to steal from us, it's this, steal the homework assignment. So we never, ever hire anybody without making them do a live audition. So at the end of a typical process, if we love a candidate, we'll ask them to essentially come back and do a homework assignment. They get three questions, two relevant to the role, 45 minutes to present. Last question is always the same, is how will you help keep method weird? And it's this live audition where you get a chemistry test, you get a sense. I mean, let's face it, sometimes the worst employees are the best bullshitters in interviews. Nobody can hide. Um, and it's this, it constantly reinforces back to the culture that they're part of something very special. 
It's not foolproof. So in your onboarding book, you also get a lotto ticket. Because we figure some people are just lucky and not good. So if you're lucky, you'll scratch, you win a million dollars, off you go. If you're actually good, you stay back with the rest of us and you keep working hard. Um, I also encourage startups to like, lay down those, those values really, really early. And my favorite one is, what would MacGyver do? So like any company growing, right, it's all about resourcefulness. And there's nobody more resourceful than somebody who can take down an F-16 with a paper, gum and chewing gum, uh, paper clip and chewing gum. And one of the things we've learned is the more serious we want people to take things, actually the less serious we have to take it ourselves. So if we told everybody, like, be resourceful, I guarantee nobody would play it back. But the way we position these things, you hear the word MacGyver every day in the hallways at Method. And one of the things we've learned, too, as we're growing, the bigger we get, the actual smaller we act. We act. We're actually getting weirder, which uh, has been amazing to me. And we're in the process of building our first plant in North America. It goes online at the end of this year. It's being built in Pullman Park, Chicago. Uh, it's part of an urban renewal project, bring jobs to an area where it's desperately needed. Um, but when it opens, it will be the most sustainable manufacturing facility in North America, lead platinum on a point scale nobody else has ever achieved, which we're super, super fired up about. And if we hadn't put that culture in place in day one, none of this would be possible. The other thing I always encourage people to do is like building that team, right, to scale. So we love design thinking, and we think very much it's about the artist and the operator. So our entire company is populated with people who I would consider to be more artists. They're innovative. They're doers. They make things happen. And operators who know how to run a company. And we pair that whole group together. So our head of design sits as a peer to our CFO and all the way through the company. So it creates an organization that really has the ability to hopefully dream up, have amazing creativity, imagination, but then actually execute. Let's face it, there's so few companies in the world that do both of those really well. So method, it's all about culture, and then it's just applying that culture to great products. So like everything you guys are probably doing, you're realizing it's all about a great product. And we live in a world where great products are discovered and shared, and bad products are discovered and shared. So to us, this is our marketing. And every dollar we put into our product is so much better spent than anything we put into, or every dollar we put into the product is so much better than anything we put into marketing. Particularly, we live in such a visual world, and digital is such a visual medium. So like three ways we think about innovation. One is about the paradox, right? You find attention and you solve attention. And if you're a parent like me and you have kids, you realize your kids, you're never going to win the war against characters. So ultimately, um, what we found is we could relieve, solve a paradox by creating something that kids love, but parents felt really good about. Funny little side note, when we launched this, I tweeted out that our hand wash hooked up with a mouse, and this was their love child, which Disney did not appreciate. But it turns out it was less about mouse sex, and it was more about the fact that um, uh, uh, Mickey is not a, a mouse, it's a character. And they're like, no, no, no. I'm like, what do you mean it's not a mouse? They're like, well, you know, doesn't run away from cats, doesn't eat cheese. Like, it's a character, not a mouse. So I, I, re, I refixed that, tw that tweet. Um, another thing we do, we love aesthetic innovation. I think people forget, too, that there's different ways to innovate. And sometimes design itself is some of the cheapest way to innovate. Because great design, consumers get immediately versus trying to do it on functionality. It's instantaneous. It's easy to explain. You don't have to change consumer behavior. And really, really easy to share in a digital form. And then lastly, like, we also just follow our passion and let our company, too. Uh, this is our ocean plastic line that we launched with Whole Foods. Uh, this is arguably the world's most expensive supply chain. Uh, we actually have to use, we've used our miles to fly our employees places to collect the plastic and then we put it back into new bottles. And again, we don't think about this necessarily as a product. This is part of our advocacy and it's part of our marketing, but we bake the marketing right into the product. And we do it from a place of passion more than a place that necessarily always makes sense on a P&L. And then lastly, it's about inspiring advocates. So if you're bootstrapping marketing, you don't have marketing dollars to convince people. You need your consumers to help you do that with you. So one of the things we do at Method is everybody understands the brand. Yes, we have a brand experience department, but I would argue our head of HR is the most important marketing person because we want a brand from the inside out, have an authentic brand, and know that anybody you may meet from Method or People Against Dirty 
is going to be an amazing representation of the brand, really live the values. So we put a lot of work into that. And I'm going to just wrap up with two quick case studies. Um, so one of them is this idea of you know, everything should be marketing, right? So that's why I wore this costume. So hopefully you'll take photos of me, you'll tweet, we'll get a little bit more earned media. I will give a dollar to everybody who tweets, the method guy was so much better than the carrot guy. <laughs> you know and I have a rivalry. Um, so uh, I was at my desk one day and I was opening up my mail, got this big package from Clorox. I'm like, that's weird. And they were sending us this big cease and desist. And um, they essentially didn't want us to be associated with the daisy, which we often used in our marketing and had been doing it for years. So essentially what we did, um, I wrote a charming little letter back saying, hey, great to hear from our neighbors across the bay. Like, wow, seems pretty silly for us to fight over an icon of peace. So why don't we just let the people decide? And left it at that. And a few days later, the site went up called Vote Daisy on Earth Day. Um, somehow the New York Times found out about it. Uh, and if you would have clicked on the video, you would have seen this. Hey guys, it's Eric and Adam. We're Methods Founders and People Against Dirty. We're here today in San Francisco with our friends, the Daisies. This Earth Day, we need your help to save the Daisy. That's right, that iconic symbol of purity, innocence, and peace. Sadly, a major corporation is claiming that they own the rights to it. Own the daisy? That's ridiculous! Did they invent the daisy? Did they design the daisy? It's like trying to own the rights to the cucumber, the question mark. No, seriously. They sent us the cease and desist letter saying that they own the daisy and that we have to stop using it. So they're essentially saying, don't touch the daisies. Even though we started using the image of the daisy about six years ago just to show how safe our products were because we don't test on animals. So we just figured we'd test on our little flower friends instead. And we never tried to own it. No, because it belongs to Mother Earth. And since daisies can't talk yet, we asked one of our scientists, and Fred said, Well, the results are in, and while a daisy will last three days in Method All Surface Cleaner, nothing takes care of daisies better than Mother Nature. So, since we don't have a lot of money for lawyers or parking spots, we just figured we'd ask you, the public, to decide who should the daisies belong to. Method, Clorox, or Mother Earth. And while we'd be honored if you voted for Method, we urge you to vote your conscience. We believe flowers belong to the planet and not corporations. So the lesson here is that everything is a marketing opportunity. And I was always inspired by Ben and Jerry's What is the Doughboy Afraid of? Their one-man picket line. And that's where we got this idea. And it turns out that it was actually a brilliant legal strategy because, one, nobody's threatened to sue us since because they know anything you send us, we will put up on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Two, uh, you could uh, download the cease and desist. So we had hundreds of lawyers download it and then write on blogs that we were in the right. And then we had all these lawyers coming out of the woodwork offering their services for free. But the biggest disappointment was I wa we never heard from them again. And I wanted them to keep fighting, so I'd be like, fine, 3 o'clock, Treasure Island, tug of war, winner takes all. <laughs> Thank you all so much.